On August 15, 2003, 41-year-old veteran construction worker Ron Hunt was part of a crew that was building a house in Reno, Nevada. On that particular day, Ron knew before he could do anything else on the job site, the first thing he needed to do was drill a couple of large holes in the ceiling of one of the rooms in this house. And so as soon as he got to the job site that morning, he went in the back of his truck and pulled out a six-foot-tall stepladder and a drill and then walked into that particular room. Once inside, he opened up a stepladder and placed it where he wanted it. And then he tested his drill by squeezing the trigger a couple of times. And so once he knew that worked, he climbed up the ladder a couple of steps, not to the very top, but just a couple of steps and began punching holes in the ceiling with this drill. Now, at first, these holes were very easy to punch through. But when he got down and moved the ladder to another section of this room where he also needed holes in the ceiling, when he got up there, he could not get the drill to go through the ceiling. And he didn't really get it because he knew there was nothing behind the ceiling that would stop the drill from going through. And it was just wood, so it really should be going through. And so he decided he just needed a little bit of extra leverage. He needed to really press on the back of this drill while he's pulling the trigger. And so instead of standing on the second or third rung of the six foot tall stepladder, he walked to the very top of the ladder, the kind of dangerous section you're not supposed to stand on on any ladder. And from there, he was in a better position to really push this drill into the ceiling. And so he gets in position and kind of feels like the ladder's fairly stable. And then he lines up this drill where he wants it. He begins squeezing the trigger. And at the same time, he really pushes with all that extra leverage into the ceiling. And as he does that, he feels the drill starting to go into the wood. But at the same time, he's pushing so hard that he's not realizing he's pushing down with his feet at a bit of an angle. And at some point he pushes too hard and he causes the ladder to spill out from underneath him. Ron instinctively tried to throw the drill away from him, which is a common practice amongst construction workers. You don't want to land on your gear. It could hurt you. But he wasn't able to throw the drill far enough away from him. And even worse, the drill, when it hit the ground, basically right underneath him, it landed on its back with the drill bit pointing straight up into the air. And so when he fell down face first, his right eye socket landed directly on the drill. And so this 18 inch long, one and a half inch in diameter drill bit impales his head, goes right through his eyeball, goes through his skull and punctures out the back of his head. And so Ron he hits the ground, but he's conscious. And so without even rolling over, he just reaches up with his hands and he feels the base of this drill. And then he traces to the drill bit and he feels it going into his eye. And then he feels around the back of his head and he feels the rest of the drill coming out of his skull. And at that point, he just starts screaming. The only other worker on the job site at the time was this man named Forrest. And Forrest, who was in a separate part of the job site, he hears Ron screaming. And so he runs over, he goes in the room and he sees Ron who's now standing up cradling the drill base. The bit, the 18 inch bit is still poking through his head and so Ron is looking at Forrest and then turns to the side to show him that he's been fully impaled by this thing and Forrest is totally horrified at what he's seeing. He can't believe Ron is even alive but then Forrest jumps into action. He rips his shirt off, runs over to Ron and kind of wraps it around his head to try to control the bleeding a little bit and then he tells Ron to stay where he is. And then Forrest ran out of the job site, ran about a thousand feet away to the nearest house. And he was able to use their phone to call paramedics. The paramedics arrive in an ambulance a few minutes later, and they find Ron sitting next to Forrest just with this drill still in his face. Ron is very obviously in shock because he's not making any sound. He's totally conscious, but he's just kind of staring blankly holding on to this thing. And so the paramedics, they go over and they detach the drill base from the drill bit. So all that's left is the actual 18 inch rod that's been pushed through his head. And then they take Ron via ambulance to a local hospital. And from there, they actually fly him in a helicopter to a bigger hospital that can handle this kind of injury. And so when he arrives at this larger hospital, they rush him immediately to the operating room. And at first, the surgeons attempted to cut off either end of this bit, the part that's sticking out the front of his eye and the part that's sticking out the back of his head. But they realized once they did that, there would still be this huge piece of bit that was stuck in his skull. And that would obviously be a huge problem. And so after thinking about it, they decided their best bet was just to unscrew the bit from his head. 
And so they gave him some morphine. And then over the next couple of hours, the doctors slowly twisted this piece of metal until it finally unwound itself out of his skull. And apparently, as they were doing that, Ron, who was so high on painkillers, was cracking jokes about how somebody needs to come in here and take a picture of me. I probably look so great. And so miraculously, Ron would survive and he would not even be paralyzed. The worst thing that happened to him is he lost the sight in his right eye. But all things considered, Ron is okay with that. The surgeons would tell Ron that the only reason he didn't die or get paralyzed is because when that drill bit went into his skull, it kind of pressed his brain aside as it passed through. Had it punctured his brain when it went through, that almost certainly would have killed him. But by some unbelievably slim chance, it did not, and he survived. Here is Ron's x-ray. Before we get into the next story, I want to talk about today's sponsor. Ever since I started this channel, I have been shocked at the number of home invasion stories I've come across where the victims locked their doors and lived in a safe neighborhood. And so for this reason, I went out and got Simply Safe. Simply Safe is an incredibly effective and easy to use home security system. And honestly, for me, a big selling point was they don't send a company to your house to set it all up. I hate that. It's totally an inconvenience. And usually you don't even know how to use the system at the end of it. So instead, they send you this really neatly packed small kit and then using their very easy to navigate app you build the system yourself and so for reference it took me less than an hour to do this and everything worked first try so it's very very easy to use also simply safe will fit any home it's fully customizable they have all the cameras and sensors for every type of door and window and they have lots of cool extra stuff like water sensors temperature sensors smart locks for doors and they even have this really cool outdoor camera that has a massive field of vision it's got 8x zoom it's got night vision and so basically at any hour of the day, you can know what's going on outside and inside your home. And Simply Safe professionally monitors your system all the time. So if anything were to happen, they would call the authorities. So if you want to feel safe like me and my family, then go to simplysafe.com slash Mr. Ballin. If you sign up with that link, you can get at least 30% off when you get your Simply Safe system. All right, back to the stories. In 2009, 15-year-old Christina Grimmie finally caved and made her own YouTube channel. For years, her friends and family had been begging her to do this because Christina had this incredible singing voice that they wanted the world to hear. But Christina had always been hesitant because she was a bit of an introvert. But that year, Christina was feeling more outgoing, and so she took the plunge, she makes this channel, and in July of that year, she uploads her first two songs. They were both cover songs, and she was really proud of them, but when she uploaded them, they didn't get very many views. And so Christina probably was not very excited about making more videos. But a month later, she found herself really enjoying the song Party in the USA by Miley Cyrus. And so she was singing it all the time and humming it all the time. And so finally she said, okay, I'll just film myself covering that song. And so she records herself singing this song. She uploads it to her YouTube channel, her third video. And she thinks no one's going to see it because her first two videos, no one really saw. But this video is different. It went viral almost immediately and millions and millions of people saw it and they loved it. Christina couldn't believe it. Even though her friends and family had been telling her all along, you have this great voice, you gotta share it with the world. That's different than actually seeing the results of the world saying, you're really great, we love your voice. And so she saw this huge opportunity and she began uploading more and more music to her channel and more and more of her videos went viral. Over the next four years, she amassed over 2 million subscribers on her YouTube channel, she put out her own album, and she even went on tour with the mega celebrity pop star Selena Gomez. In 2014, Christina auditioned for the TV singing competition called The Voice. This show only allows a very small number of contestants who are all incredibly talented musicians. They get screened really aggressively before the competition even starts. But despite the very intense competition she was up against, Christina still managed to finish third overall in this competition. Now, she might have been a little bit let down that she didn't finish first, but that show did wonders for her career because the judges of this competition were mega celebrity musicians, and every time Christina was on TV doing her performance for the competition, the judges would be raving about how talented she was and that even if she doesn't win this competition, someone's going to sign her. She's so incredible. And then sure enough, shortly after that competition, 
relation ended, Christina was signed to a major record label. But despite being considered a star by the masses, Christina still very much viewed herself as being a YouTuber first, which meant despite her mainstream popularity and fame, she continued to upload songs and vlogs to her YouTube channel because she wanted to stay connected to her fans. YouTubers often upload videos that appear very amateur, like not professionally produced. It almost looks like anybody could have picked up their phone and filmed that video. And YouTubers tend to be very candid and show their personality in their videos. And so it makes YouTubers, especially these really popular ones, seem very real and raw and relatable. Unlike traditional celebrities that are kind of outside of society, living in their mansions, living a totally elite and different lifestyle. YouTubers feel like they're your friends. And this was definitely the case with Christina. On her videos, she came off as very humble and gracious and kind and friendly. And so her fans truly adored her. By June of 2016, Christina was still growing in popularity when she was asked to be the opening act for this concert in Orlando, Florida that was happening later that month. She agreed. And then on the day of the concert, which was June 10th, she posted to her social media this kind of shout out to all of her fans saying, hey, if you're in the Orlando, Florida area, come out to my show. And then after the show, I'm going to stick around and sign autographs and meet you guys. That night, the venue where this concert was happening was jam packed. And most of the people were there for Christina, not the main act. And so Christina, she goes on stage. She has this incredible performance. The main act goes on stage. And then around 10 p.m., the concert ends, at which point Christina comes back out from behind stage and went right out into the crowd. And and began meeting her fans and hugging them and signing autographs and taking pictures. And then at 10.24 p.m., a man who was a fan of Christina's walked down from the back of the venue and kind of awkwardly gestured that he kind of wanted to get a hug. And Christina saw that, and so she smiled, and she walked up to him. She opened her arms to give him a big hug. And when she got just a couple of feet away from him, he drew a pistol, and he fired four shots into her head and into her body. Christina's brother, Mark, he was standing right nearby and he saw the attack and so he tackled the shooter and he was trying to get control of this guy but at some point the shooter managed to wriggle free and then he stood up and he kind of walked backwards until he was literally up against this wall looking at the sea of people that are totally horrified people are screaming and running and no one knows what he's going to do next and then the shooter just raises the gun puts it to his head and pulls the trigger there were people in the audience who were medically trained who rushed over to christina and they began performing cpr on her, but there really wasn't anything anyone could do. She would die that night at the hospital. Her killer was a 27-year-old man named Kevin Loibel. He, like many people, had become a Christina superfan, but his infatuation with her became a totally unhealthy obsession. And when it eventually dawned on him that he most likely would never have a romantic relationship with Christina, he came to the conclusion that if I can't have her, no one can have her. And so when Christina put that post out on social media asking people to come to Orlando to see her show and meet her after the show, he took that as an opportunity to go kill her. And so he lived in St. Petersburg, Florida, which is 120 miles away. And so he sees this post on social media. He grabs his two pistols, some extra ammunition. He gets a large hunting knife, and then he calls a cab. The cab drives him 120 miles northeast to Orlando, Florida. And then he gets into the venue with his weaponry because there weren't metal detectors and no one was frisking people as they came inside. And so he was in the back of the venue during the show. And then when it was over, he kind of lingered back Back, allowing other fans to go up and, you know, kind of mob Christina. And then when there was a lull and there were less people down there with her, he strode right down the aisle and he ended her life. Here is a photo of Kevin standing in the back of this venue just moments before the show came to an end. In 2019, 21-year-old Samantha Josephson was a senior at the University of South Carolina. She was a brilliant student who aspired to be a lawyer. Specifically, she wanted to practice international law. And so in order to do that, she needed to be able to speak other languages besides English. And so during her college years, she had really leaned into Spanish and become quite good at it rather quickly. During her college Spanish studies, one of her professors was a woman named Daniela Jaimes. Daniela very quickly recognized 
recognized in Samantha that she had this incredible intellect and work ethic and just knew she was destined for greatness. In fact, she compared Samantha to Amal Clooney, who is George Clooney's wife and is considered to be one of the most famous international lawyers ever. And so just out of a general interest to see Samantha succeed, Daniela offered to Samantha to kind of be there for her if she needed anything beyond just Spanish, that she was there to help her with law school applications, or if she needed advice on something, or if she just had ideas she wanted to bounce off of her, she would be available. And Samantha had taken her up on this offer, and by 2019, in Samantha's senior year, the pair had become very close, forming a sort of mentor-mentee relationship. Early that year, Samantha got accepted into her target law school, Drexel University in Pennsylvania. And so after telling her mother and father, Samantha ran to Daniela's office to tell her mentor the great news. And the two hugged and laughed and celebrated right there in the office. It was clear that everything was falling into place for Samantha, and Daniela was just very, very proud of her. A few weeks later, on March 29th, Samantha decided to go out with her friends for some drinks. Now, Samantha normally spent a lot of her time studying, even on the weekends, but since she was about a month away from graduation and she was already accepted to law school and really didn't have that much work since it was the end of the year anyways, she decided she could cut loose for that weekend. So she, along with her friends, head out to this downtown area called Five Points, which is right near the University of South Carolina, and it's an area that's full of shops and restaurants and bars, so on the weekends, it is packed with college students. Samantha and her friends hop from bar to bar, they're having a great time, and then around 2 a.m., the group found themselves in a bar called Bird Dog, and while they were there, because it was so crowded, the group of friends got separated. Now, initially, the friends were trying to reconnect with each other through texts and phone calls, but they were just really struggling to locate each other. And kind of in the middle of all that, Samantha decided that she was just too tired and didn't really feel like staying out any longer. And so she texted her friends and let them know that she was going to head back to her room. So Samantha leaves the bird dog bar on her own. She hops in an Uber and she starts driving back towards her campus. Several hours later, after all of Samantha's friends had also finally gone home and then woke up that following morning, they realized Samantha was not in her room. And so they called her. She didn't pick up. They started asking around to other friends who might know where she was, but no one did. And so pretty quickly, Samantha's friends were very, very worried about her because the last they had seen her, she was leaving the bar on her own. And so they were really worried something might have happened to her. And so by 1.30 p.m. that day, on that Saturday, the day after they had gone out, they called the police and reported her missing. At the same time that Samantha was reported missing, there were these two men who were in their mid-20s that were located 70 miles to the east of the University of South Carolina. They were out in this forest and they were hunting for turkeys. Earlier that day, these two men, whose names were Anders and Ryan, they had had no luck actually finding these birds. And so they were getting frustrated. And so by the afternoon, they had split up and were kind of combing this forest on their own to see if they would have more luck solo. And so Ryan, he posted up next to their truck, which was parked on this dirt road that was butted up against the edge of this big forest. And Ryan, with his binoculars, was scanning out across this field that butted up against the tree line of the forest. And he was kind of scanning the tree line, but he still was having no luck finding any turkeys. And then Anders, he actually had walked into that forest, which was right next to Ryan. And he was just kind of walking around looking for the birds as well. But he, too, was still having no luck. And so around 4.30 p.m., Anders, who's the one in the forest, he finally is just ready to admit defeat and leave empty-handed. And so he turns around and begins walking out of the forest in the direction of Ryan. And so at this point, he's maybe one or 200 feet away from Ryan, but the trees are very thick and they can't really see each other. And so Anders is just kind of walking in that direction. He's not looking for birds anymore, so he's not scouting around. He's just kind of looking straight ahead. And as he's walking, something catches his eye off to the left behind some trees. It was pretty far away, but he instinctively turned and looked, and he couldn't really tell what it was. It wasn't a turkey, but it wasn't anything that should have been in the forest. And so he decided he would go get a better look. And so he turned away from Ryan and went left and started cutting through the trees. And he kept walking until his view of this thing was no longer obscured by trees. And when he got a full look at this thing that had caught his attention, he stopped where he was. He yelled for Ryan, who couldn't see him, but he yelled for him to come into the woods and look at this and as Ryan is running into the forest to see what's going on, Anders is pulling his phone out and calling the police. When the police finally show up, they find Anders and Ryan and they're very shaken up 
and they're sitting on the back of their truck on that dirt road where Ryan had been. And so the police pull up to them, they speak to them and get directions of how to get to what they saw inside of the forest. And then the police officers walk into the forest, they follow the directions, and before long, they're looking down at Samantha. 14 hours before her body was discovered, Samantha left the bird dog bar and walked out front where there's lots of other students. And she walked to this corner of this road right in front of her and she hailed an Uber. And then the Uber car pulls up, she hops inside and then the car backs up and drives away. Except that was not an Uber car. That was a car driven by a 24 year old named Nathaniel Rowland, who was not an Uber driver. He was a guy who had been driving around five points all night, presumably to try to trick people into getting into his vehicle, believing it was an Uber. And finally, his plan had worked. He had pulled in right in front of Samantha. She thought it was her car. She climbed in without question. And then once she was inside, she couldn't get out again because the doors were child locked. There was no way to open them unless they were opened from the outside. Now, initially, Samantha wouldn't have noticed this. She just sat in the back seat. The car backed up. It started driving, except it didn't drive towards her campus. It drove the opposite direction. And the drive from this bar to the campus was only a couple of minutes long. And so even if she wasn't really paying attention, she would have recognized fairly quickly they were going the wrong way because, again, she's expecting to get dropped off within a couple of minutes. Now, we don't know what actually happened inside that car in terms of of how Samantha actually handled this realization that he was taking her the wrong way. We don't know if she confronted him. We don't know if she tried to open the door and then realized it was child locked. We just don't know. All we know is that Nathaniel drove Samantha to some isolated area, most likely 70 miles to the east, near that forested area where her body was found. And then once he parked wherever he was, Nathaniel pulled out a knife and then leapt into the back seat of his car where Samantha was trapped. And he stabbed her 120 times. And then after he was finished stabbing her, it would take Samantha over 10 minutes to finally die. Within hours of dumping her body in the forest, Nathaniel was posting these normal posts on Facebook of him in front of his car and regular status updates. And he was having very normal interactions with his family and his friends as if he was completely unaffected by this horrible crime he had just committed. Nathaniel was arrested within 24 hours of the discovery of Samantha's body. While he never offered any motive for the crime, it's believed he simply decided that night he was going to go kill someone. And so he just began prowling around for a victim. And unfortunately, Samantha was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Nathaniel was ultimately convicted of her murder and was sentenced to life in prison. Here are the final images of Samantha as she climbs into Nathaniel's car. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments section what it is. On Friday, August 21st, 2020, 58-year-old Aristides Polino was driving back to his home in Miami, Florida in his police SUV after completing a midnight shift. Aristides was a 25-year veteran of the Miami Police Force, and over the last two plus decades, he had routinely done midnight shifts, so this was nothing new. When he got to his house, he parked his SUV in the driveway, and like always, he went right into his house. He didn't talk to his wife Clara or his son. He just went straight up to his bedroom and immediately fell asleep. About four hours later, at 5 p.m., Aristides woke up and he expected to hear his wife's voice somewhere in the house. So when he didn't, and the house was just totally silent, something told him that something was off. 
So he climbed out of bed, he put on his clothes, and he went downstairs to look for his wife. When he got down to the living room, he saw his son sitting on the couch, but he didn't see his wife. And so he asked his son, you know, hey, have you seen your mom? And he would say, no, I haven't seen her. But sensing on his dad's face that something was wrong, he said, hey, I'll help you look for mom. And so the two men began searching the house, yelling out for Clara, and Aristides began calling his wife, but she wasn't picking up. And after several minutes, the two men reconvened in the living room, and they started going over whether or not she had told them about some appointment that day, and that would explain why she wasn't in the house. House. But after talking about it, they decided that she didn't have any appointments and she should be home right now. And so the men decided, you know, maybe she went outside and she's talking to a neighbor or, you know, she went for a walk and she's talking to somebody on the road. And so they decided they would go outside and search the outside of the property. When they got outside, Aristides went towards the back of the property and his son went towards the front down towards the driveway. And so as Aristides is making his way around the back of the property, he hears his son scream out for help. Aristides comes running back around the property and he sees his son standing in the driveway with the door of his police SUV wide open. Four hours earlier, after Aristides came home, he parked his police SUV right in the driveway like he always did and for some reason he left the car unlocked. And so he goes in the house and he falls asleep. And while he was sleeping, Clara, who was home, she exited the house and walked down the driveway to his SUV. She opened up the door and went inside. It's believed she was looking for something, although we don't know what she was looking for. And while she was in the back of his car, fishing around for whatever it was she was looking for, the door she had entered the vehicle in shut behind her. And because this is a police SUV, the back seat was designated for suspects. And so the back two doors did not open from the inside. And there was a very thick partition separating the back seat from the front seat. So Clara could not just reach over the seats and honk the horn to get someone's attention. And Clara Clara did not have her cell phone, so she couldn't call anyone for help. And when she screamed out for help to somebody out on the road to help her, her screams were severely muffled, and the back windows of this police car were heavily tinted, making it extremely difficult to see that there was a person in the back seat of this car. So for four hours, Clara desperately screamed and kicked and punched and did everything she could to try to free herself from the situation she was in. All the while, the temperature inside the car continued to go up. The SUV was parked in full sunlight, no shade whatsoever, and the temperatures that day were over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And so by the time Clara was ultimately discovered, the inside of that SUV had effectively become an oven. Aristides ran over to his vehicle and he pulled his wife out and he started doing CPR on her, but it was too late. She had died of heat stroke. Her death was ultimately ruled an accident. On May 22nd, 2021, a father and his young son were out for a walk in their small suburban town just outside of Barcelona, Spain. When they reached their downtown, they were going to turn around and walk back home, but the boy pleaded with his father to make a quick stop at the old theater. The reason the boy and many other kids in the town loved going to this old theater was because out front of it was this huge paper mache statue of a dinosaur, a stegosaurus to be exact. And so after a little bit of convincing, the father finally agrees and they start heading in that direction. After they turned the corner and could actually see the dinosaur statue, the boy took off running while the father just stayed back and walked leisurely watching his son the whole time. And as he's watching his son, he can see he gets right up to the statue and then the boy just kind of suddenly stops and stares at something on the bottom of the statue. And so the father notices his son has seen something peculiar enough to make him stop and stare. And so he yells to his son, hey, what do you see? And the son just points at the back right leg of the statue. And so the father thinks this is really weird, so he jumps dogs up to his son and he crouches down right next to him and looks in the direction his son is pointing. And at first, the father believes all his son is pointing at is this fairly obvious crack on the outside of the statue on the back right leg. And he's thinking his son has just noticed that the statue is kind of falling apart. But as he's looking at this crack that his son is pointing at, he realized his son was not pointing at the crack. He was pointing at what was behind the crack, what was inside the dinosaur statue. And when the father realized what he was looking at, he grabbed his son, stood up, and ran in the other direction and called emergency services. A few minutes later, the police and fire department show up in front of this old theater. They get out and they go up to the statue and they confirm what's inside this back right leg. Afterwards, they go to their trucks and they get out chainsaws. Eventually, 
eventually they were able to carve a big enough square on this back right leg that they were able to remove the thing that the father and the son had seen originally, and that was a dead man's body. Not much is known about this dead man, except that he was a 39-year-old man who his family had reported missing a couple of days before he was actually found. While we don't know this for sure, it's believed he decided to crawl inside the statue when he realized the belly of the dinosaur was movable. Now, it's not entirely clear how he figured that out. Either the belly was already moved and he saw the opening and so saw the opportunity to crawl inside for some reason, or he was poking and prodding at the statue and discovered the belly was movable, moved it aside, and then again seized the opportunity and crawled inside. But either way, the man crawled inside the statue, and then once he was in the dinosaur, his phone slipped out of his hand or slipped out of his pocket, and then instead of falling out of the dinosaur onto the ground, it fell inside the dinosaur and slid down the inside of the statue until it fell into the bottom of the bottom right hand leg. And so the man decides to go after his phone, and so on his belly, he slides over to the back right leg, and then he begins lowering himself head first into the leg, reaching for his phone. And so as he's kind of slowly lowering himself down, using his legs to pin himself inside the statue, he gets closer and closer, and he's almost about to grab his phone when his feet lose their grip, and he slips and falls head first all the way to the bottom of this back right leg. The space he was in was so tight, he was not able to turn himself around and climb up and out again. In fact, it was so tight, he could barely move. His arms were pinned by his side, and so he couldn't use them to even push himself back up and out. And because he could not bend his legs, he could not use his legs to pull himself back out again either. And so this man most likely began screaming for help, but for whatever reason, nobody heard him. And so after what must have been several agonizing days, the man finally just died. His autopsy has not been made public, so we don't know for sure what actually killed him, although one could speculate he died of either dehydration or perhaps asphyxia from being trapped in this really tight space where his chest may not have been able to expand all the way, and so he would have eventually suffocated. Following the gruesome discovery, the dinosaur statue was removed from the front of the old theater. In the early 1980s, John Harder was the classic, athletic, popular kid at his high school in Delaware, Ohio, which is a relatively small town just outside of the state's capital. But unlike most stereotypes that paint high school jocks as being these total jerks that bully people and they're kind of stupid, John was none of those things. He was incredibly friendly and very warm-hearted and seemed to get along with everyone. John also was known for having a great sense of humor. In particular, he liked to play these kind of harmless pranks that would make people smile, like the time he very enthusiastically joined the cheerleaders during a high school pep rally, despite not actually being a cheerleader himself. John was set to graduate from high school on June 5th, 1983, and his plan was to study accounting at Kent State University the following year. A few weeks before his graduation, John's high school began selling these tickets to a grad night at a huge amusement park called King's Island. Kings Island was located about two hours west of John's high school, and it was home to dozens of roller coasters, water slides, and many other attractions. During their so-called grad nights, this amusement park would shut down their public operations and not let anybody into the park that did not have these special student tickets that they gave to local area high schools. John, who was 17 years old at the time, was very excited at the idea of going to this grad night, and so he went and purchased tickets along with about 20 other students from his high school. At about 3.30 p.m., on Friday, May 13th, John and the other students who had bought grad night tickets met up outside of their high school. While this was a school-sponsored trip, the students were responsible for driving themselves to the park. And so after all the students were accounted for, they all piled into a couple of their cars and they began their journey to the park. After a few stops along the way to get food and go to the bathroom, the students finally arrived at the park at about 7 p.m. And on the drive, John, who had been a passenger, had drank half a bottle of rum and about three to six beers. And so when he got out, he could barely stand, he was so drunk. And so the students made their way over to the front gate, they showed the attendant their grad night ticket, and they were allowed inside. And surprisingly, despite it being this special night where only people with these tickets were allowed in, it was still pretty crowded. There were lots of students that apparently wanted to come to this event. Once John and the rest of the students from the Delaware High School had come inside the park, there was no rule that they had to stick together for the duration of their time there, and so they all kind of broke into their separate groups and went their separate ways. In 
John's particular group was his girlfriend, Pam. And for the first hour they were in the park together, all they did was bicker and fight. Onlookers would say, John looked visibly upset and very emotional and very drunk. By 8.30 p.m., when John's group had gotten in line for this roller coaster, John was now openly saying, I don't want to be here anymore, I just want to go home. It was pretty obvious he was still just mad at Pam, and that's why he was saying all this, was just trying to make Pam feel bad. And so some of the group members told John just, hey man, calm down, you're overreacting, just try to enjoy this ride, and then afterwards we'll get some food, it'll be fine. But it was pretty clear that John was really worked up and seemed incapable of having a good time at this point. But regardless, John and the rest of the group, they got on this ride, at about 9 p.m. and then after the ride was over they disembarked and they walked away from the ride to regroup and figure out what was next and they're looking around and John is nowhere to be found and so after waiting for a few minutes and actually walking around looking for him they decided that you know what he was really upset before he got on this ride he probably just wanted to walk away and be by himself for a bit I'm sure we'll see him later in the night so John's group without John just continued going around the park going on different rides and for the next few hours they kind of forgot about John John. It wasn't until the end of the night when over the loudspeaker the park officials said okay we're closing the park now that they started walking out and wondering where John was and they were convinced you know what I'm sure he's back at the cars he's probably waiting for us because he just wants to go home. And so they leave the park they get out to their cars in the lot and John's not there and so at this point the group's starting to get a little bit concerned because no one knows where he is they're meeting up with the other groups from their high school no one's seen John and so they're all just kind of staring at the front gate waiting for John to come out but he doesn't. And then eventually the lights in the park start shutting down and the security guard comes out front and locks the front gate. And that's when the group knew they had a problem. After an extensive investigation by police, this is their best guess as to what happened to John. After John and his small group rode that roller coaster around 9 p.m., John very quickly disembarked the ride before anybody else in his group could see him. And then John stumbled his way towards the replica Eiffel Tower that this park was famous for. This tower stood at about 300 feet tall and was built to be an exact replica of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France, but this one at Kings Island was only a third the size. It had three elevators that went up the center of the structure, and the elevators would stop at a 50-foot platform and a 275-foot platform where guests could look out and have a great view of the park. While today the only way to access these two viewing platforms is through these elevators, at the time John was at the park in 1983, the park actually had a flight of stairs that went from the ground all the way to the very top of the tower that went right up the middle of the structure and the public was allowed to take these stairs all the way up to the first platform that 50 foot platform and while the stairs did actually continue beyond that up to the 275 foot platform the public was not allowed to go any higher on the stairs than that first platform and so if you took these stairs once you got to the 50 foot platform there would be a big fence right on the stairwell preventing you from going any farther and it says authorized person only, don't go any farther, and so the only people that would walk up those additional flights of stairs were staff that had a special key. When John stumbled his way over to the base of this replica tower, he did not get on an elevator. Instead, he took the stairs. So he made his way up to the 50-foot platform, and then when he got to the six-foot-tall gate preventing him from going any farther, he just climbed up and over it and continued walking up the stairs, and nobody stopped him. He finally came to a stop just below the 275-foot mark. And so he's on the stairwell, and at this point he turns and faces the inside of the tower. It's all these metal beams all over the place, and he climbs over the railing of the stairs he's on, and he climbs onto this narrow beam that's actually a part of the support structure of this tower, and he grabs onto the beam above him and just begins walking along this beam towards the center of the tower where the three elevator shafts are. Now, there's no safety net on either side of John, so if he slips and falls, he's falling hundreds of feet to the ground. And if he keeps walking and actually gets into the elevator shaft, there's nothing protecting him from being struck by one of the elevators because the people who built this tower were not thinking about people walking on these exposed beams hundreds of feet up into the air. This is a totally dangerous and unauthorized area. But John just continues shimmying across this beam until he does get to the middle of the tower and now he's literally standing looking down into the elevator shafts. And as he's most likely looking around admiring where he was, 
one of the elevator cars below him began to start moving. To understand what happens next, you need to have a rudimentary understanding of how this elevator worked. A large metal rope was attached to the top of the elevator car, and from there it was thread up the elevator shaft all the way to the top, where it was fed through a pulley that was anchored to the ceiling, and then that rope was fed right back down the shaft to the bottom, where it was attached to a counterweight. A counterweight is just a large heavy weight that's designed to balance this elevator car on this pulley system. Without the weight, the elevator car would just slip off of that pulley. And so anytime the elevator car moved up, the counterweight would move down and vice versa, making sure that car was always balanced. And so John is standing right on the edge of this elevator shaft, presumably just kind of looking around, admiring where he was, when down below him, that elevator car starts to move and it starts to actually descend away from John. And so the car itself is not necessarily a threat to John. However, its counterweight is because if the car is going down, its counterweight is going up and it's right in the path of John. And so as John is leaning out over the shaft, looking around, this counterweight comes screaming up and picks him off of the beam he's on and carries him up into the shaft. The impact on John was so strong that it's believed he was actually impaled on some of the exposed metal wiring on top of this counterweight. And he got totally tangled up in all of the cables on top of there. And so as John is desperately trying to free himself, the elevator operator, there was always a staff member inside of these elevator cars, he actually noticed when John got stuck on the counterweight. But of course, this worker would have no idea that's what it was. They would later recall, it just felt like the car suddenly jumped. And so this worker, fearing that something had gone wrong with the elevator car itself, he decided he would ride it all the way to the bottom, let everybody get out, and then ride back up to the top, totally empty, to make sure that the car actually worked before allowing people back on. And so the worker went to the ground, everybody got out, he closed the doors, he began his ascent, he got to that first platform at 50 feet, no issues, he got about 10 feet above that first platform, so at about 60 feet, when all of a sudden he hears an unbelievably loud thud on the roof of his elevator car, causing his car to immediately come to a stop. And then blood began pouring over the sides of the car over the windows. After getting stuck on the counterweight, John probably did everything he could to try to free himself, but he just couldn't do it. However, when that elevator worker decided to go back up again to test the capacity of the elevator car, it reversed the direction of the counterweight that John was stuck on. And so as that car was going up, John began going down, and it was on this descent that parts of John's body must have been dangling off of this counterweight, and they must have struck one of the beams as he was going down, and that beam effectively pried him off of whatever he was stuck on and threw him over the edge into the center of the shaft. And so John would fall 200 feet and he would land on top of that elevator car, dying instantly. The park was very quick to block off the ride and the whole scene and got police involved very quickly. So only a very small number of guests and employees were aware an accident had even happened. And very few of them were aware that it had been a fatal accident. As for the police, they knew they had a dead body, but they had no way to identify the body. There was no ID cards on John. And so they had no way to let his friends know that were in the park or to tell his family. And so it wasn't until that night when John's friends are out in the parking lot waiting for John to come out again, that they got really worried and they went up and spoke to a security guard at the front of the park. And that security guard, after hearing their story, would tell them that actually there had been an accident in the park and there was a body and the police are still trying to identify this body. And so maybe you guys want to go over to the hospital and see if it's your friend. And so sure enough, the friends went to the hospital and they would confirm that the body was John Carter. To this day, no one knows for sure why John did what he did. Some say he was just drunk and it was a dumb decision that led to his death. Others say he was suicidal, but many Many of the people that were close to him say, no way, he was not suicidal. And other people say, you know, John, he loved attention. And so perhaps this was a dangerous stunt gone too far. But regardless of his reasons, John had clearly intentionally entered an area that was off limits and it got him killed. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comment section what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top.